minute or so. Let's give them another minute to, to log in as the audience will join kindly. Welcome everyone. Um, we're just gonna give you a, another minute or so just to log in. Um, thank you. Okay, it's, um, I'm sure others will log in as we go along, but um, let's give a big welcome to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar where we're honored um, to, to have Professor Henry Schroeder and Ahmad Zohdi uh, talking to us. A huge thank you to the EANS, uh, the Executive Committee, and particularly Anna, who has been so good at facilitating these webinars and all the other actions and um, uh, progresses that the sections and task forces are, are, are making. Thank you, Anna. Um, it's a really pleasure and honor to be here to be able to moderate this. And this was one of the visions that the uh, CSF task force had to incorporate or to involve uh, experts in this field in neuroendoscopy as the, the group is developing, as the field and speciality is developing. And we could not think of better people really uh, around the world than Professor Henry Schroeder and Ahmad uh, Zohdi. Professor Schroeder really and Ahmad do not need any introduction. And between 2014, 2017, uh, Professor Henry Schroeder led the WFNS Neuroendoscopy Group. And he's now president of the International Federation of Neuroendoscopy Group. Um, and Ahmad Zohdi, who's a close collaborator with Professor Henry Schroeder, also needs no introduction, uh, particularly in Egypt and from, the, um, uh, from that section of the world where he has huge experience in this field. And both, two, both of them really have perhaps, I think, more than maybe 60 years of experience as professors in this field and experience in thousands of these procedures. So a uh, huge thank you to you both. Um, Today's uh, uh, webinar is going to focus more of an introduction into the principles of neuroendoscopy and some little tips and, uh, uh, and pearls just to whet our appetite. This will be the first of a series. The next one will be regarding endoscopic thermoventriculostomy, nuances and quite a lot of detail about that particular procedure. Um, as, and then to follow about endoscopic uh, colloid cystic excision in another webinar followed by neuroendoscopy for cystic lesions in the CSF pathways, and perhaps another one or two more to come. So um, without further ado, uh, I welcome you all, and I hand over first to Professor Henry Schroeder to begin the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Welcome. Yes, thank you for this kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to talk here about neuroendoscopy. I think you make a very great job, Mansoor, with the CSF task force. It's very, uh, a lot of work and you handled it very nicely. So thank you for the invitation. I think neuroendoscopy is of course a very important topic when you are dealing with CSF pathway problems because you can treat a lot of conditions with an endoscope much more effectively than for example, with a shunt. So today I want just to give you some tips and tricks how I do it. So it's a very personal talk about how I do these procedures. So when we talk about intraventricular endoscopy, we are dealing, of course, with the ventricular system. We have the lateral ventricle. We have the foramen of Monroe leading to the third ventricle. Then we have the aqueduct and we have the fourth ventricle. And if you have anywhere as obstruction here, you have a dilation of this part. And then, of course, it's ideal to be approached by an endoscope. But also in normal sized ventricles, if you have the right ventriculoscope, you can also go to a normal sized ventricle to take a biopsy or 
to make other procedures. The, the problem with uh, intraventricular endoscopy is that you have an underwater surgery. That means if you have a little bit blurring of a CSF, for example, by bleeding, immediately your view is obscured and it's very difficult to handle this. Because if you make movements and you don't see very well, there is a risk that you injure the structures in the ventricle. So you have to be very careful. So I want to talk about the ventricular scope, what we developed to together with uh, Karl Storz companies. It's a lot of ventricular scope. There are two different sizes. One is used mainly for uh, tumor resections, colloid cysts and arachnoid cysts, and the small one for ETV and biopsy, et cetera. We also use flexible endoscopy in the beginning. This is this fibroscope, that the image quality is very bad and the guidance is more difficult. So in the last years, we have almost abandoned it. Initially, we used it a lot for aqueductoplasties. There is a flexible video endoscope available from Stott's company, but unfortunately <clears throat> it's not available in Europe because it's not autoclavable. This is uh, sterilized with gasterization and this will not kill the prions. And that's why it's not allowed in, in, in Germany. That's, that's very sad for us, but in America and South America, they use it a lot. So what are the advantages of richer endoscopy? We have a superb optical quality because we have rod lens endoscopes. We have a good illumination, magnification, and high resolution image. It's very easy, easy to guide because it's rigid. If you turn the camera on the right way, you have a good orientation and, and it's very easy to guide it. Orientation is the same. And we have large working channel, larger than with a flexible scope, and therefore we have very effective surgical instruments, for example, for tumor resection, colloid cyst resections. The disadvantage is, of course, we cannot work around the corner because it's a rigid endoscope. And when you move the endoscope in the cortical compuncture channel, you have more risk to damage tissue around. So what for me is very important is that you have a ventricular scope and an endoscopic sheath. This endoscopic sheath is not just for introduction, but I use this as a retractor. I can use it to push a tumor aside. And that's why for me, it's very important. Also for hemostasis, I use it a lot. So the endoscopic uh, troca is put into the endoscopic sheath and the ventricle or cyst is punctured and the thing is removed and the ventricular scope goes inside. So retraction with an endoscopic sheath, for me, it's very important, for example, for colloid cysts. And I use the endoscopic sheath for a lot of uh, different maneuvers uh, during the surgery. Here, for example, is one example. This is the view to a colloid cyst in the third ventricle. And here I go with my endoscopic sheath in front. So the endoscope, the ventriculoscope is re uh, withdrawn a little bit. So I see the edge of my endoscopic sheath and then I can push the fornix upwards and you see I have a good exposure to the, to the cyst and I can remove it in a very safe way because now I see all the structures around and I see the membrane of the colloid cyst. When we have a very small foramen of Monroe and I want to dilate it a little bit, we have this optical troca. That means it's a conical shaped troca, but there is a, um, an, um, a hole inside where I can insert a 1.2 millimeter straight endoscope. So I see where I want to go. And that is used, for example, in very uh, narrow conditions. You see, this is a patient with a hypothalamic hematoma. And you see there's almost no foramen of, of Monroe. When I want to go with my sheath, you see I will damage the sedimus dry drain or will damage the fornix. So therefore, I perform a foraminoplasty, so I dilate the foramen of Monroe a little bit. This can be done and will not damage the fornix. And then I take my optical troca, and this dilates the foramen a little bit, and I can go in into the third ventricle. And you see here, this is a typical hematoma on the left hypothalamic wall. And when I go out, you see there is no damage to the fornix. So the optical troca is for these kind of small foramina, which I want to dilate. Of course, if the foramen is too small and you want to enlarge it by two millimeters or three, you will rupture the fornix fibers. That is not good. But if it's just one millimeter, you can dilate. 
So the lotta ventricular scope has an outer diameter of 6.1 millimeter. And what is most important for me is it's a large working channel of 2.9 millimeter. And that is very important if you deal with colloid cysts and with the larger tumors. And then we have two irrigation, inflow, outflow. Also, you can use the side channel to have a second instrument. And the outer diameter of the sheath is 6.8 millimeter. So it's a little bit large for some foramen of Monroe. So you have to look at the MRI very precisely which endoscope you choose according to the size of the foramen of Monroe. That is a very important take home message. I like to have the endoscopic sheets fixed with a pneumatic holding arm. Some people don't like it. If you have a very experienced assistant, he can guide the endoscope. You're much quicker. You don't have to fix it, lose it, fix and lose it. But if you have an unexperienced one and have ne very narrow uh, conditions, for example, in the, in the third ventricle, then of course, uh, it's more risky that you make unintentionally movements and damage the, the walls of the ventricle. So that's why I like it. So it's here fixed, rotationally stable. And if I want to rotate the whole system 180 degrees, I have to loosen the screw and then the endoscope is movable within the sheath, so I can rotate it. The little lot of ventricular scope has the same design, also with an endoscopic sheath, which is important. It's a smaller 3.6 millimeter, but the working channel is just 1.6. So the tissue removal, if you have a tumor, is of course not as effective. And the outer diameter of the endoscopic sheath is 4.5, which fits through most of the ventricle uh, to the uh, mon uh, foramen of Monroe. Here's an uh, a comparison of the larger lotter and the little lotter, and you see it's a really a big difference. But the optical quality of both is excellent, especially, of course, of the larger lotter because the diameter of the lens is 1.7 millimeters. And here in the little lotter, we have 1.2. But you see, compared to flexible scopes, the old fiber scope is a much better quality of the image. Of course, with a new video scope, flexible video endoscope, you have the same quality like this. But this is, uh, of course, even better because uh, it's larger. A HD camera is nowadays a must, in my opinion, because it gives you a much better view. We have also inspection endoscopes. The diameter is 3.3 millimeters. It is with 0, 13, 45 degree, and we may look around. And then we have smaller endoscopes with 1.2 millimeter uh, diameter. This is for inspections through small holes, what you have created to check whether it's the right uh, trajectory. This is um, a 0 degree and 30 degree. This is one view with a 45 degree endoscope. You see, this is a fornix, this is an anterior commissure, and this is a contralateral fornix on the left side. So, just by turning the endoscope, there's no tilting, so no damage. I just turn it and it goes like a radar around. So, here you see the fornix on the left side, fornix right side, anterior commissure, lamina terminalis, and then down here, you see the optic chiasm. And this was a child you see here is some seeding of a medulloblastoma, which is on the floor of the third ventricle. Now I can turn the endoscope 180 degrees to look backwards. And you see here, this is the entrance into the aqueduct. This is a posterior commissure. And this is the roof of a third ventricle. And this is habinular commissure. So and you can see all the structures just by rotating the scope with a 45 degree endoscope. And when you go very close with the lens to the blood vessels, you can even see erythrocytes running through the, the vessels. This was a craniopharyngioma. Such a high resolution you can get with an HD camera and a very good endoscope. This is a view from, an, from the back to see the fornices from the other side. You see fornix running here, fornix running here. This is the anterior commissure, lamina terminalis. Different instruments are necessary. This is a deck forceps. This was a very good idea from Philip Deck. There are the teeth outside. So if these are used to puncture the floor of a third ventricle, and then you dilate, the, you open the forceps, and this dilates your fenestration. When it comes to scissors, in my opinion, it's very important that you have a sharp pointed scissors and that one branch is fixed. 
there are some scissors where both are moving, but this is very uncontrolled because you must imagine you have very, very limited spaces. So I like to have one branch fixed and the other is movable. So I bring always the movable to my view and then I can cut and have not the danger that I cut in inadvertently. There's a grasping forceps biopsy force and the larger forceps for tumor resection. All of the instruments have a markation of the length. So if you see this small black ring here and you bring it to the entrance of the funnel shaped entry port, then you know that the tip of the instrument is exactly at the tip of the scope. This prevents that you inadvertently or un unintentionally go too deep with your instrument through the uh, endoscope. And when we do our courses, you see frequently that the endoscope as uh, the instrument comes and hits the contralateral wall because you're not aware how deep you are. But with this markation, all the instruments have it. You know exactly where you are. Then we developed a guillotine knife. The guillotine knife was designed to cut membranes, overlying arteries. So we bring this uh, foot um, under the membrane and then the blade comes from above and you, can may, you may check there is nothing inside. That's very helpful if you have arachnoid scissors. You see, this is a regular scissors. There is an artery below this membrane. And you know, the tip of the blade goes always to this artery. So it's a risk, I cut it. So with a guillotine knife, I can go under the membrane. I elevate the membrane and then I come down with my blade and I can cut it without the risk that I damage the artery, which is running under this membrane. So for arachnoid cysts, I, I use it very, very much, especially Sylvian cysts, when you have some uh, structures below this. You see there's an the artery and it's well protected. So for hemostasis, there are different uh, instruments available. There's a bipolar rod and there's a bipolar forceps. And we have, of course, irrigation, which is ad, uh, attached to one of the irrigation channels. And then for suction, we use uh, a Chaillet 8 uh, uh, endotracheal suction tube. This is a diameter of 2.7 millimeters. You see an example how we coagulate the choroid plexus overlying a colloid cyst with a bipolar forceps. It's a very effective instrument. It's very, very nice to use. And when we have a larger hemorrhage, we use this the small chamber irrigation techniques. The name was created by Jotham Man Waring. He was a fellow with us for some time, and he thought this is a nice description of this technique. And it remain it it, it, main, um, it means that if you have a hemorrhage, we start with the irrigation, and then we go very close to the bleeding point. And you know, if you have a large cavity, it's very difficult to clear the view if you have a bleeding. That's why we go very close with the sheath to this point. So the bleeding goes mainly to the sheath. And then we go back with the endoscope for five millimeters to create this small chamber. And this small chamber, you can also be cleared with irrigation. So you see where's the hemorrhage. And then I come with my bipolar rod to make a hemostasis. You see this one arachnoid cyst. And I cut, was not very alert, avert that there is a small artery and you see this is a very tiny artery. So in microsurgery, you would not recognize it. But here with the underwater surgery, you have immediately the Japanese flag. You just see red. What you do now, you start, of course, with irrigation. And then you get the glimpse of the anatomy. And then I go closer with my endoscope to find the bleeding point. This is not a vein, it's an artery. So it has to be occluded because it will bleed a long time. Venous hemorrhage usually ceases after the few minutes of irrigation if you have not a major vein. And so I come now with my, um, my bipolar. You see my bipolar is coming and I compress the artery. And now you see this is a fox. And now I have a good view and I can look you. And you see here, there's a small branch. So the major artery is intact. It's just a small branch. There's nothing in microsurgery, but here, it disturbs the view. You see the bleeding vessel. Just to confirm, this is a bleeding source. And then with the bipolar, it is compressed. And then coagulation is applied 
to close this branch. This is called small chamber irrigation techniques that you have a good control of it. So hemostasis is very important. The best thing, of course, is to avoid any bleeding. But if you have bleeding, you should irrigate, try to locate, and get the hemostasis. This is another example. It's a collet cyst. You see by manual technique, I have to pull on the cyst to get access to a small artery, which is attached to the cyst and comes from the telechoroid of the third ventricular roof. So I coagulate, you see, three times or four times, and I thought this might be okay. And then I take my scissors, puff, oh shit, too early. You see, it starts to bleed, vision becomes blurred. So I leave the cyst, go to my rear uh, irrigation, and then again, I use a small chamber irrigation technique. So I try to locate it. Irrigation, irrigation. Then I go back in my sheath. You see here at the margin of the sheath, create a small chamber. Then I go to the third ventricle. I elevate the fornix a little bit because otherwise I will not get access to the artery because it's arising here at the telechoridia. But you see now I have a good visualization because the small chamber can be cleared even if it's an arterial bleeding. And then I take my bipolar and I have a coagulation of this vessel and then I can resect it. Continue with the cholecyst resection. So nothing happened. Sometimes we have a problem that we have really a major hemorrhage and irrigation is not working. Then we use a dry field technique. We have described it first time in 2002 in our paper on collet cyst resection. And Joachim Oertel from Homburg has put um, five or six cases together where we have used it. It's a very effective technique and it's always indicated if you cannot control it with irrigation, then you have to remove it. So see, you see, this is a colloid cyst, the same patient I showed you before, the misunderstanding between me and my assistant, we just want to rotate, but he pulled on the, on the forceps and you see, boah, major hemorrhage. And we tried with irrigation, but it became very obvious that this will not work. So we did not irrigate much. We just took a suction tube, 2.7 millimeters with a working channel and then we aspirate bloody CSF. And this is interesting, in all of our cases, we did not find a bleeding source. Just by removing the CSF, the bleeding stopped, and then we could continue. Usually you have to refill the ventricle because the ventricle tends to collapse. So if you have cleared the view, we just fill it again with, uh, with a ringer solution. So this was not, this was just a clot. There was no vessel, this was just a clot. And we remove all the clots. And then we continue with our surgery. So even if you have a major hemorrhage, it's not the need that you, you stop it. You see, we have a very good view. Again, no damage to the fornix. So we continue with our resection. So dry field technique is really um, a helpful technique if you have problems. Then what I like to have is a flexible biopsy forceps. It needs to be flexible because the side channel of the lotoscope has an angulation. So we go in with a flexible instrument in the side channel and the main instrument in the straight channel. This by manual dissection is important when you have colloid cysts or other cysts. You see there was a cyst overlying the, phon uh, the phonix. I can grasp the cyst and I can cut. If I don't grasp it, it falls down to the phonix or to the salmostriate vein, there is a risk that you damage it when you cut. So the bimanual technique is very important. This is a holding device I use. It's a pneumatic arm, Mitaka arm. It's very nice. You just press this golden button here and then you can uh, correct it in a very nice way. So you don't have to uh, fix a screw or something like this. And of course it's draped sterile before you use it. Irrigation can be also be done with this off-label use of the atro pump. The problem is the atro pump goes to 1,000 millimeter mercury or so, or 200 millimeter mercury, and has a high flow. So it's for knee surgery. But if you are careful and you place it in the right level and you go down with a moderate irrigation, moderate pressure, you can also use it if you have a, a tumor surgery and you have a prolonged 
irrigation. But most of the time, we just use a syringe for irrigation. And what is important with the left hand, you guide the endoscope left, right, up, down, in, out. And with the right hand, you just control the depth of the forceps. Frequently, you see people, they try to bend. It's very normal because you look and you want to go to the left and you try to bend it. But in this rigid endoscope, it's not working, of course. So with the left hand, you guide the direction. And with the right hand, just you go in and out with your working instrument. Neural navigation can be easily adapted to the endoscopic sheath. So you have always the control of the trajectory. It's very helpful to find the ideal point in small ventricles and colloid cysts or in any unusual trajectory. For ETV, we don't use it in all cases. And this is our setup. We have the navigation images and here we have the uh, images of our endoscope. When you start with endoscopy, it's very important that you make an individual planning of the approach. It is of utmost importance. You need a very good imaging. And usually today we have MRI. Only when the patient cannot get an MRI because of pacemaker or something like that, we, we have CT. And we have the standard images. And then for CSF pathway obstructions, we use inversion recovered topospin echo. This is sequence which shows flow as a black signal. And you see here in the aqueduct is no black signal. That means there is a stenosis. And then we use constructive interference in steady state. It's a high resolution T2 weighted images. This is a Siemens machine. I think if you have Philips, you, it's called Fiesta or Drive when you have Toshiba. So, but there is the same. This is a high resolution T2 weighted images. And you see all the uh, dilation of the aqueduct before the stenosis, bulging of the floor, bulging of lamina terminalis. So it's a very nice imaging for your approach planning. What are indications for endoscopy? This is occlusal phytocephalus, of course, any type. Interventricular tumors, colloid cysts, arachnoid cysts, pineal cysts, and intraparenchymal or ependymal cysts. All these are ideal indications for endoscopic approach. The selection of the approach is very important. Here, one example. You see, this is a young lady. She presented with headache, vomiting, and nausea. And you see, there's a dilation of a third ventricle, bulging of the floor, and there's a lesion in the aqueduct. So what is the aim of our procedure? Relu resolution of the, of the hydrocephalus and to take a biopsy. Can this be done from one approach? One here, one here. Is this possible, yes or no? It's sometimes possible, but what is the bottleneck of the approach? It's the foramen of Monroe. So we have to look how is the size of the foramen of Monroe. And you see in this case, on both sides, it's very minor. So if you come and you make this and this from one borehole, you will damage your phonics for sure. Of course, this should not be done. So what can be done is, you make a straight approach, pre-coronal borehole, make an ETV, and then you take a flexible scope for the biopsy. Or if you don't have it, you make a second borehole in front to have a straight trajectory to the tumor. So that is very important when you plan the approach to please look at the frame of Monroe. What is the size? It's very important. I have seen really disasters because the surgeon did not look. That is very, very important. If you have a white frame of Monroe, then the ideal point is not at the coronal suture, but go two centimeters in front. Then you can reach the floor and you can reach the pineal region. But look at the foramen of Monroe. Large foramen, you see floor, aqueduct, no problem. Small foramen, it's not problem. So it's an individual based uh, learning what we have, um, uh, so individual based approach planning according to the anatomy. So I think I could stop now, Mansoor. These are the technical things. Now we could come to indications and think we should do this uh, in the next time. Thank you, Henry. That was uh, superb. Um, I, I've learned a lot myself just, just mm -hmm. listening to this uh, brief introduction. That's excellent. Um, I'm just looking at the moment. Uh, I'm sure people are enjoying. Um, as I have just a couple of questions, if I may just put to you. There's lots of questions, in fact, but um, uh, and I've made note of quite a few uh, to, to ask you. 
some basics is what fluid do you use for your irrigation? Do you use normal saline? Do you use Hartmann's? Do you have any tips and advice for that? Ring a, ring a solution. Okay. And do you think that makes a big difference whether you use that as opposed to normal saline? Because some believe it's more toxic. Yes, I think it's a problem. We had one case where we had an arachnoid cyst. And this was a longer procedure. It took a little bit longer. And the nurses gave me saline. And we irrigated. So the whole CSF was removed and was just saline inside. And this patient could not be extubated because it was severe hyperventilation. Mm. So we had to let him sleep for one night and in the morning and CSF was replaced and he was good. But this was for me a clear indication that this is obviously not good. So we don't irrigate much. So some people say we start immediate irrigation when we start with a procedure. No, that's not. When there's no bleeding, we don't irrigate anything. We just go in, make an ETV, go out. If there's some irrigation uh, needed, then we use Ringer solution. That's excellent. Uh, another question is, do you find you get a tachycardia and a hypertensive response if you irrigate a lot, particularly if you've had bleeding? Or, no, or... we don't have it. We had bradycardia when we make an ETV in some yeah. cases. And we had, one, yeah, we had one case where we also had a bradycardia because it was very early, it was in the early 90s. And the output channel was blocked. And then there was a lot of irrigation because there were hemorrhage. And then the endoscope was removed and the, pff, a fountain came out. This patient has obviously a kind of temporary herniation yes, from yes. this. But otherwise, I have no problem with the irrigation. Thank you. Another quick question is, you mentioned about the two-hole approach and looking at the frame of Monroe, particularly <laughs> with a pioneer lesion. Um, have you had the issue where you've rapidly decompressed the ventricle with an ETV and you take the scope out and the ventricle's collapsed and you can't get in with your next hole? How do you combat that? Do you leave in a, a drain to kind of ensure that you can fill the ventricle again? Or have you yeah. not found that as an issue? I must be honest. In all my pioneer cases, I did it from one per hole. I had Thank never you. this case that it's so small. That's not uh, um, possible. You know, when is there is a tactile glioma, I don't take a biopsy. When it's a typical tactile glioma, I think you just make an ETV because the natural course is so benign. Yes. And if you see there is a tumor which is enhancing or so, then anyhow, I will remove it. You mm -hmm. know, for example, in, this, in the lady, what I showed you, we made a removal from the telovela approach. Yes. So it depends. When, when this is correct, but I don't think the, the ventricle is collapsing so rapidly if it is a long-standing hydrocephalus. Of course, if you have a, an acute one because of a hemorrhage or so, then you have the problems with collapsing. But if you have a, a chronic hydrocephalus, what is usually in these tumors, it's an, uh, mostly it's a little bit long-standing hydrocephalus, it should not collapse completely. But it's correct. The question is what you do first then. Usually when we have a tumor and uh, we want to make a biopsy and an ETV, I do first the ETV because it is important because the patient is suffering from the symptoms of acute hydrocephalus. So we usually we make an ETV, and then we go back and tilt the endoscope to take a biopsy. Thank you, Henry. Um, the, there's a couple of questions from the audience, but one is for your email and, and uh, compliments. Um, the second question, I'm, I'm not sure what it, what it means, but it's an anonymous attendee. What do you think about a frontal approach for your case instead of an interhemispheric one? I'm not sure how that applies. So um, ca can I perhaps ask a, another question, which, um, which has been on my mind? You said it's good to, it's essential to stop the arterial bleeder. And of course, but when you've evacuated the hematoma and the CSF, we see that there are even the arterial blood bleeders eventually stopped with maybe with spasm. Um, do you think it's therefore feasible to, to rely on just irrigation, uh, waiting for it to stop or not? When it is a small, very tiny artery, which you might sometimes see at the floor of a third ventricle, I think then you can wait. Yeah. If you have a major one, what I showed you, where I cut it, <laughs> then I think it's not good to leave it. You know, in our series, we had one lethal subarachnoid hemorrhage because a surgeon at that time did the cervicalostomy behind the basilar tip and he ruptured one of the perforating arteries. Mm -hmm. And then during the surgery, he irrigated and it stopped. And the patient 
went to the um, to the ICU, and then after 12 hours he has a major rehemorrhage and died. So I think if you have such a vessel which is uh, an artery, so I think it should be coagulated. God forbid, yes, indeed. One final question, uh, Henry is. Um, do you ever use, let's say you're doing a septostomy, um, do you ever use the bipolar just to sort of cut with it, uh, the septum, or do you always use a sharp instrument? For a septostomy, yes, and my technique, maybe we can talk about it in the next, one of the next is a coagulation. I make a, a circumferential coagulation of about one centimeter, and then I take the flap out. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Henry, brilliant introduction, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm going to ask Ahmad to kindly uh, start. Ahmad, uh, welcome, please continue. Uh, thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear. Thank you, Ahmed. Welcome. I'm just going to give you an overview about intraventricular lesions and how to deal with them uh, endoscopically, not solely endoscopically, but how to really put the endoscope into your armamentarium and make use of it and not abuse the patients by being dogmatic and just using the endoscope for the sake of using the endoscope. Okay, this is where I come from. Uh, and these are the old buildings and the Dean's office. And this is with the fish eye effect, the scopic view, the new buildings of Castellani hospitals. We are mounting up to 6,000 beds. And this faculty is about to be 200 years old. Now, from my personal experience and out of my archives, I'm just going to give you the overall picture of the population that you deal with. This is starting back in 93 till last September 21. And you can see that mainly the main targeted populations are the ones who needed an ETV. Uh, of course, endoscopic inspection per se and the scope controlled microscopic surgery were not included in this number, neither the endonasal ones. Uh, the, the main age groups were the pediatric, three to one, as compared to adults. And these are all the possible other procedures that were done with their percentages. The current endoscopic procedures, I mean, using the endoscope, this is a versatile technique, whether you're going to use it alone and with inspection, or whether you're going to do surgery with it solely, or, and this is coming in the next slide on what to do and what not to do, but in order to sum up, you have the fenestrations, which is an ETV or to assist or set. Uh, the restoration, foraminoplasty, aqueductoplasty, the excision and biopsy, and the endoscopic shunt procedures, which entails the refashioning, the replacement, the re-guidance, the redirection, etc., etc., etc. Our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you cannot help them, at least do not hurt them. Dalai Lama. Now, always stick to an algorithm and have a plan in order to avoid or minimize the frustration that you might face with endoscopic surgery. Because from port to exit, you're going to be faced with a lot of anomalies. Abnormal anomalies, normal to the fact that these are hydroxyphalic changes that are going on. You have to learn the rules of the game and then you have to play better than anyone else. Neuroendoscopy neuro should be a predictive and not a reactive surgical procedure. You should have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and as it goes on, as much as plans, always in your mind with priorities, of course. 
endoscopy in intraventricular lesions mandates. Of course, a tedious learning curve. You have to start with the easiest procedures and then build up. Uh, uh, the most important thing I believe uh, before you do any endoscopy, you should be in total command of the morbid anatomy. And this is something which I would uh, really advise to have a session alone for the morbid anatomy, the scopic anatomy. Uh, the concerns are the tools. You still up till now don't have a real bipolar forces. You have a bipolar electrode, a ball electrode, but an actual forces where you want how we are accustomed to neurosurgeons to work with the bipolar and how we dissect with it and how we do the, bi the, the, the coagulation, et cetera, et cetera. This is not very much feasible with the endoscope. Endoscopic ultrasonic aspirator probe, still, if there is one. And the holding system, I fully agree with Henry that I am a believer of the holding system. Even if you have a good assistant with you, it will not harm. It's always beneficial. The port technique, you either work through a cylinder, a cylindrical conduit, a transparent one, or you work actually through the sheet that you have and you, and these are things more technical that we are going to discuss in further sessions. You have a straight trajectory, put this in mind, whatever is behind you, you are blind. You have to memorize your trajectory and your corridor so that you do not lever on the structures behind you and cause an undue hemorrhage. The bimanual dissection, as also Henry has stated, you use to, to push maybe through the outflow channel, another balloon uh, catheter, uh, and maybe use it to, to do some hemostasis or to, to, to push the, the cyst uh, more towards you to be able to aspirate the contents, etc. I will show you some tricks as we go on. And of course, the hemostasis, the profuse irrigation, the balloon, and never give up, the balloon pressure, the small chamber uh, uh, irrigation technique, and the dry field technique. Now, always bear in mind to select, and there is no harm in that. You don't go and rush into cases which are actually not feasible to be done uh, endoscopically solely or endoscopically uh, assisted microsurgery. The size, preferably less than two centimeters. Uh, of course, hydrocephalic changes are preferably there. Uh, and uh, put in mind if the ventricular size is not as big as your, or would not accommodate your endoscope and its sheet, then use the mini uh, version of your endoscope as Henry has suggested. Consistency of the, of the, of the tumor, preferably soft, and if solid, better avascular. Standalone procedure versus endoscopic assisted, endoscopic control, or back to microsurgery. This is the pendulum. We had this option uh, when we started. You see, we started microsurgery or, or without even working with uh, binocular uh, uh, loops. Uh, and then with microscope, and then with endoscope, and then combining the endoscope with the microscope. Uh, passing through all this, it, it's a cumulative experience. But I guess the nowadays neurosurgeons of the, 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 the coming up generation will also find it proper to, to, to really integrate all your armamentarium and not stick to one of them and not uh, be uh, prejudiced about uh, one kind of surgery. Uh, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I anticipate there is going to be a lot of uh, new technology coming up in the coming decade, and it is your choice. You have to hang on and you have to uh, always uh, update yourself. Persevere, hope for the best, and if not, don't be stubborn, convert, and plan for the worst. These are just uh, interesting cases that I wanted to 
show you. This is a cavern noma blocking the foramen of Monroe and causing unilateral hydrocephalus of one lateral ventricle. And this was actually doable with the endoscope. And you just go in, locate your lesion. You start removing it in a piecemeal fashion as long as it's not bleeding. And when it is, you coagulate with the uh, with the uh, ball electrode. And then in order to make sure that you don't get a profuse bleeding, you just push the Fogarty catheter into the foramen of Monroe and inflate it so that it would cause some cause of devascularization to the tumor. And then you continue, continue, continue with your job until you get this outcome and you have removed the lesion and job done. Another kind of cavernoma, thalamic one, which is here and is causing hydrocephalic changes, as you can see in the MRI. Here we would go for a solid ETV, and you don't touch the cavernoma. You leave it for the adjuvant therapy. And you make visual confirmation of your basilar artery to make sure that you've done your job well and leave the rest for agility. You have to have this sense of tailoring every approach and tailoring even the management. Don't stick to one kind of, uh, of course, I'm an advocate of the endoscopy, et cetera, et cetera. But this does not mean that I don't put a shunt. Sometimes I have to. There are limitations to everything. Now, this is, these are very interesting cases. And I always emphasize on this fact. These are, this is the Kocher burr hole. I consider it the keyhole uh, burr hole for the for your surgeries in the in the uh, ventricle, and you see a huge tumor blocking the foramen of Monroe in a sort of valve valvular manner, ball and socket, and the pedicle is at the right lateral wall of the lateral ventricle. Removing it, you can remove it endoscopically, but it would have taken maybe three or four hours. So the decision was to enlarge a mini craniotomy thumb size. And with the cochlear burn hole, you can always say, well, I will go anterior or I will go posterior, and still in a safe place and do my, uh, the excision, the actual excision of the tumor. As you can see, it is just lying on the foramen of Monroe. And I will tell you now, and I'll show you why the endoscope is also needed. Because as we did this and we finished and we shaved it from the lateral wall, we just went into the endoscope again to inspect. And very interestingly enough, as we went into the third ventricle, we found a sort of seeding, an ulcer from the tumor. Although it proved to be an astrocytoma grade two, but it did change the management in only leaving the patient after that for a wait and see or whatever follow up to more of an adjuvant therapy thereafter. Now, this is if you have a lesion more posterior, you would go and do the other type of mini craniotomy. Both of them are thumb sized, and you do your job, or even in such a case where you do your job and you do a sort of an excisional biopsy and you remove the pressure and you leave the, the rest for the adjuvant therapy. Managing choroisis, I'm a believer in that your savior and your guide is the Kocher burr hole. If you go into a Kocher burr hole, this is your keyhole. And then when we look at the, 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 all the uh, types of uh, choroisis, that maybe in one session for uh, alone, we will discuss that. You are, you can do this, as I mentioned before, a mini craniotomy, more of anterior to the scoffer bureau, or you would go this way, more posterior, after looking actually visually and, and documenting what kind of a cholesterol you're dealing with, this is, the, is it, uh, is the uh, foramen totally blocked? Is the foramen uh, widened, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Or 
you might feel that you only need to do extend a little bit anterior and a little bit posterior. Endoscopic maneuvers with uh, colloid cysts are aspiration of the content or piecemeal removal accordingly, combined balloon squeeze and aspiration for more viscid contents. And this is one of the tricks that we always advocate. And this is uh, the video of this case, detailed on the left side with all the pictures and what you do. You suck the contents out, and whenever it's not feasible anymore, you push a, a balloon catheter that you inflate, and you squeeze out and milk out the contents of the colloid cyst until you don't. And once you're there, and once the floor is widened, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I insist to do MGTD. Otherwise, if it's parrot beak and it's a, it's a small one, no, I would not. I would, I would go for an EVD. This is a controversy. Anyhow, uh, you do a foraminoplasty, you do a cytostomy to a coagulation of the cystostomy whenever the uh, colloid cyst is tucked up and pushed forwards and has both uh, fornices on both sides covered and blocked, and the foramen of Monroe is blocked. So you go uh, through the septum to lucidum through a cytostomy and maybe you do even interfornicial dissection of the colloidal cyst. Uh, this is when you're doing it totally endoscopically. Combat bleeding with the, 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 the tricks and tips that we have mentioned before, the CSF diversion, ETV, EBD, a debatable issue. We'll talk about it in a session on its own. Other endoscopic options that you can, might uh, uh, deal with endoscopically, this is a triventricular hydrocephalus with a posterior uh, third ventricular mass, a pioneer region tumor, which uh, going in would you would find surprisingly so that there is a seeding, but still there is place to do an ETV and it is doable. While in other cases that I might show you later, it is impossible and you should not try it. Here it is possible. And then I did not do a biopsy. You know, I could have taken a biopsy out of this cellular mass and I mean the seeding in this, uh, in this part, but I prefer to do an interhemispheric approach and I remove the tumor totally. And then uh, this is a triventricular hydrocephalus due to a sort of a cyst that was evacuated part partially. And it proved to be a, uh, with, the, with the wall and the part was taken to a cystic astrocytoma yet uh, grade two. <coughs> and he took adjuvant therapy, but an ETV was done to relieve the pressure. Put in mind that posterior fossa lesions are not, are for endoscopic procedures and ETV, but take care both the brainstem and the basilar apex and basilar bifurcation and the basilar artery itself are pushed forwards. So you have to find your way, uh, take your time, and you need not stick to the midline because the midline, you'll find that the basilar is pushed against the dorsum cilia. So you can find your way on each side and you can do it. This is also an interesting case where you went in and we found that this was a medulloblastoma grade four with a seeding totally obscuring and there is no way to do an ETV and no way to, to insist on doing it. So a ventricular peritoneal shunt with a sieve was put to this patient. Interesting case also is a choroid from the choroid plexus, cyst arising from the choroid plexus and blocking the foramen of monorole. And this was easily removable. This entity is also a very interesting entity in the proximal intrasystem and obstructed hydrocephalus. You meet these cases when a, when a not quite a specialist in pediatric neurosurgeon removes a fourth ventricular tumor and he's not very careful and he's not meticulous about the bleeding 
that might be oozing from all the tumor and going into the system, the magna, and blocking the pathway, the proximal inter, it could cause a proximal intrasystem obstructive hydrocephalus, and you would deal with it preferably with an ETD than a shot. We did a, quite a long time ago, two decades ago, uh, we used to attack each and every posterior fossa tumor, attack it first and not definitively uh, the definite tumor by doing an ETD first. <clears throat> but we came out of this series uh, of 247 cases 162 were intraventricular, three of them additionally intraventricular, but we did not do a pre-hand ETV. And this is the algorithm that you should use. And I'd better stick now to the, the, to the right-hand side the, uh, algorithm for intraventricular lesions. And this is what we are doing so far, but nevertheless, we did change and we are doing, after doing another study, local mass effect and secondary CSF pathway interruptions, inclusion criteria with the metalloblastomas, the ependymomas, and the exophytic brain stabiliomas, and then ETD was not done, and EVD was done, the same session with the tumor removal, and then the EVD was used for ICP monitoring, and if an ETD was needed, it was then done, if this was a soft total tumor excision, and uh, brainstem gliomas, and the shaving was not the, 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 uh, the absolute optimum. Uh, so an ETV was needed. And if ETV fails, we do a VP shunt. It's all about a set of mind, the knowledge, a set of skills, the learning curve, and of course, your endoscopic equipment. Patients, safety comes first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmad. That was excellent. A, a very good uh, introduction and summary of the principal steps. Um, can I begin with well, there's quite a few questions which I could put to both of you. Um, but um, Henry, sorry, Ahmad, you, you just mentioned that the most important thing, perhaps, that patient safety comes first. In line with that, one of the big challenges, particularly for a CSF group and section in terms of education, um, is training. How do you advise that trainees get to train appropriately in this field? Because a lot of the pathologies are not very common. So how, what do you advise regarding optimizing training? For example, case sharing, fellowships, and so on and so forth. Um, do you have any advice about that? Welcome, Ahmed, if you can. I need to answer or you need? Uh, please, why don't you start, Ahmed? It's, it's, um, you... I, I would sincerely advise uh, the exposure. The exposure is a, is a, is a very important in a, in a uh, well-equipped center. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the first thing is the morbid anatomy. The morbid anatomy, you have to be in total command of the morbid anatomy, because this is not the anatomy that we've studied. I mean, this is anatomy that you acquire. Of course, it is, as Henry stated, it is a 2D issue, but you acquire with the shadow, with the illumination, with the zoom in and zoom out, a third D. And you even acquire a better fourth D by being in different places. This is something that you are not accustomed to with a microscope. And you with different views and the, 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 uh, the corridors that you, you see with your, with your different telescopes with the different angles. And again, a fifth D is the pathological issue. How, how, how is the, when you go in with the endoscope, acute hydrocephalus is not, with a posterior fossa tumor, is not like the uh, uh, congenital hydrocephalus with a chronic kind of hydrocephalus and with all the structures uh, stretched out, displayed, etc., etc. So you have to be ready. And as I stated in one of my slides, from port to exit, 
you are facing different kinds of anatomies, starting from the foramen of Monroe, so starting from the venous uh, the, uh, vessels or the venous, uh, uh, the veins that are uh, uh, going into the foramen of Monroe, they are not uh, constant. Everything is not constant. Everything, the amount of colloid mixes, the inclination of the foramen of Monroe. I mean, these are, this is the prime thing to learn. Have a perfect command of your anatomy, of your morbid anatomy. And then see a lot as much as you can. And as you mentioned, exchange. Exchange. My colleague did a case, you did a case, always exchange. Oh, this is what we used to do. Because we were the, at the time in 93 and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, you, you could you could actually count them on your own. On your, on your <laughs> hands, there were how many were doing endoscopy. So we had to exchange the knowledge. Thank but you, Ahmad. Thank you. Doing it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ahmad. I, there's quite a few questions. If I could maybe put uh, start putting the questions to both of you, if I may. Uh, one of the uh, questions which has now been clarified is about access to um, doing a biopsy for the pineal region. And um, splitting the choroidal fissure. So could you just comment on when you do the biopsy, when you put your scope in, what you techniques you can use to, in terms of maximal angulation of your scope, scope backwards? Because the fornix is at the front. You've got your thalamus stripe vein posteriorly. Is there any tips or advice uh, that you can give for that? Um, but I, I, I'll expand a bit more on it. I remember Ugo Ture was saying that he looks at CTV whenever he was going to do anything to access the third ventricle, because usually the thalamus stride vein is more dominant on one frame and compared to the other. And the danger is that you put your scope in and you angle it backwards and you might cause some venous hemorrhage and you're far less likely to do major venous hemorrhage or any damage if you're putting it through the frame and where there is not a prominent vein posteriorly. Do you have any comments about that? Henry, would you like to comment? Because I'm not a, I am You're not on mute, Henry. You're on mute. Topic uh, biopsy and uh, a dual uh, thing at the same city. I will do it. Uh, I will take the. I will do the ATV and CSF sampling, and I will go for an interhemispheric approach. Enough. But Henry has another view. Yeah, I think it's very, very individual based on the anatomy. So we have to look at the individual anatomy and you cannot 100% predict how is the situation. I think it, MRV is not, it's not necessary because on the regular T2 weighted images, you see the veins usually very nicely. So I think it would not add any, any benefit for me because I want to see the relation of the vein to the fornix and to the foramen. And what I have shown the one case where the thermostoid vein was almost occluding the foramen, you could, you could uh, see this already on the pre-op MRI, that there's a big vein running through the foramen and there's no space. So you can predict it from the T2-weighted MRI. And then when you want to open the correct fissure, it can be done in some cases, especially if you have a larger tumor, which dilates already the foramen. For example, in colloid cysts, sometimes you see the choroid um, the choroid fissure and you can cut it simply with scissors. But sometimes it's not possible because there's no space. And I have seen people who try to do it in an endoscopic way to split it and the fornix did not look, look good afterwards. So if the fissure is very tight then microsurgery is much better. You can make an interhemispheric approach like Ahmed suggested or you can what we frequently do when we have uh, enlarged ventricles, we go in with the endoscope, we see it's not possible without damaging the fornix, or at least the risk is high that you damage your fornix. Then I remove the endoscope and bring a tube in. The tube follows just the cortical puncture channel of my scope. And then I'm in the ventricle, and then with two hands, I can dissect. So I put a petty, I displace the, um, the fornix, away from, from the um, from the vein and from the coral fissure, and then I cut it. So I think it's much safer for the phonix. It's not that cannot be done. You can you can everything do with an endoscope, but the outcome of the patient is what matters most. And we have to be very careful with phonix and veins. You are muted, Mansoor. Thank you very much, Henry. Just 
in, in relation to that, just the final quick quick question is, do you think there's any merit in choosing your frame and depending on the anatomy? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. When you see when you see, for example, in colloid cysts, that the one foramen is very wide, the other is narrow, or the fornix is covering the cyst, you go from the white side. If you see there's a big vein in the foramen and you want to make an ETV, and you see on the right side, what is usually taken is not good, you come from the left. Of course, that is what I wanted to stress. You have to look very precisely to the MRI. And I have been an expert witness in some cases, lawsuit cases, and sometimes people did not look they looked not at the size and came with a very big scope and they went to the third ventricle and the phonix was gone. So we have to be very careful and look at the anatomy. And then you have to judge is your endoscopic equipment um, suitable for this approach, what you want to do. Thank you, excellent. A question to both of you, how do you deal with the webs following an endoscopic thermogenostomy? Uh, sometimes you see a lot of webs, sometimes not much at all. Quite often you can predict on the MRI, but do you think it's, do you take any steps? Do you take any, do you employ any techniques to, to divide those or deal with those? Sure, when you open the floor of a third ventricle and you see there's a liliquist membrane, you have to open it as well. Otherwise you have not the positive flow. If you don't have this positive flow, that means you see the edges of the ventriculostomy going up and down, then something in the system is wrong. And then there are cases where you have more membranes. And then you look again at the cis sagittal image and you can predict the membranes. And if you see that the all clivus is full of membranes after um, hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, it, I think it makes no sense to try to open them up. But sometimes you have three, just two or three additional membranes. And then of course it's useful to open it. Ahmed, Sah? Yes, I agree. Any comments? No, I don't have the, actually the visual confirmation in the prepontine system is a mandatory issue to say safely and to tell the relatives of the patients uh, or the patient that I have done my job and we are going to wait and see. And according to the age of the patient, then, uh, especially with infantile uh, cases, infants, uh, it's, it's, it's another issue. But the actual satisfaction would be a visual confirmation of the basilar artery in the prepontine system. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Ahmad, there's a question um, from Ahmad Sami. He says, thank you, dear consultants. I asked about ETV as prophylaxis for, from, from hydrocephalus before post fossa tumor excision or VP shunt. Uh, will be if affect more than ETV? I, I guess he's asking, what is your advice about dealing with, uh, which I think you've already dealt with, about post fossa tumor? Um, and someone who's got hydrocephalus, do you do an ETV? Do you advocate that? Uh, yes, definitely. Definitely advocate, especially because you are not always a, a, a really expert uh, pediatric uh, neurosurgeon who would come and deal with the posterior fossa tumor is not available 24-7. So if you get a case with some sort of Plus coma scale 13, 14, <clears throat> and he's not there, and a young child, you definitely have to do him as a, as a, as a saving procedure and for, for to, to, to gain some time uh, until the everything is ready. And ETV, no, I'm not against it, totally. But if you are to choose, and everybody is there between an ETV or a definitive surgery, I would go for a definitive surgery. And if CSF persists, I would do an ETV. But I'm not against doing an ETV in posterior fossa tumors on the contrary, especially in the Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, maybe perhaps points related to that is that another advantage of the ETV is that you can see the third ventricle. Sometimes you see tiny little seedlings of tumor. You can, um, uh, I mean, that it's useful to, to see that if that is the case. Um, and if you do an ETV, do you tend to leave in an EVD for these cases or a reservoir at all? Or do you just do an ETV in posterior and fourth ventricular tumors? It, it's, it depends again, uh, because I've shown you uh, aftermaths of posterior fossa surgery and this uh, proximal intersystemic obstructive hydrocephalus, which is also a very important issue to have it in the back of your mind. 
And uh, if there is a lot of spillage of blood running around the cistern, the magna while you're doing your surgery, and you did not put enough patties and you're not a meticulous surgeon, uh, I wouldn't say a clumsy surgeon, but any, anyhow, the end result would be approximately the system of septum hydrocephalus. You always have to bear in mind, and then if you are afraid of, or you've seen that the, it will end up like that, and it will do, you better put an EVD. EVD for 48 hours is not a shame. It's, it's, but you have to know how to deal with it and all the nursing stuff, etc. The ICU people should be fully aware, not to overdrain, not to uh, sure. higher up the level or whatever. Sure. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, a question to both of you, just, uh, but actually before one of the um, audience has asked, how do we follow the integrity of stoma in ETV, both post-operative post radiology and clinically? Do you want to add anything to that uh, besides? The we do the cis sequence and the inversion recovery turbospin echo that you see the flow void. Initially, we did CNI MRI, but this uh, is not absolutely required. I, I, I like to have this black signal, and it's very nicely seen with the inversion recovery turbospin echo sequence. And then we have the cis where you see the stoma size. That is what we do. I go furtherly, and maybe it's a little bit more costly. I'd like the patients to do uh, uh, in due time, maybe in three months after the ATV, uh, an MRCS inflammatory with definitive measurements and with the uh, overall uh, flow amplitude uh, clearly uh, documenting and, and, and ensuring the fact that the, this area is really uh, or this stoma is is doing its job. But it's not a guarantee that it's working. So if there is a resorptive component in the hydrocephalus, even if you have a very good flow, it can happen that the ETV is not successful in the clinical terms. So the patient is not improving. When you talk about age, okay, this is this is definitely I do not disagree. But I mean with the uh, children with the uh, closed sutures and fontanelles and, and uh, adolescents, etc., etc., uh, it gives me a good indicator. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, a simple question Do you fix the head? Um, and if so, which operations endoscopically? And the reason why I ask, I've had you know, um, my fears when, and once it did happen, when patients had moved on the horseshoe headrest. And fortunately, I rest, I hold the scope through the fingers on the left hand and rest my hand on the head directly. Um, so all was fine. But um, do you take any precautions or do you think horseshoe headrest is fine or do you fix with three pins? And for ETV, we, we just place it in a horseshoe. But we tell the anesthetologist, please don't move. And I always have, I had this experience once as a patient came up that is extremely, extremely uh, uh, dangerous. But in, in cases, of course, for colloid cysts, when we use navigation, we fix it rigidly. Also, if you have small children, you also cannot take a rigid fixation. We just place them in the silicone pad and fix it with the plaster strap. But of course, you have to be very careful. This is a disaster if the patient is moving and we had this once. Unfortunately, it was a huge ventricle and nothing happens, but this can be a disaster. So we always advise the anesthetologist, please put him really down to sleep, relaxation, he should not move. Yeah. I, I always use uh, for the ETV and for uh, arachnoid cysts, supracellar, et cetera, and definitive procedures where you're going to use one trajectory uh, and, uh, and you might might have to tilt on one side or the other, especially if you want to do additional uh, CPC, uh, Freud plexus uh, coagulation. Uh, I, I need to, to move the head, but uh, other than that, uh, I fixed the head. Thank you to both of you. Um, there was an earlier question about uh, coagulation plexus coagulation. I'll come back to that, but one of the other audience Ahmad Risk is asking um, sometimes 
we perform ECV for intraventricular tumor, then remove the tumor microsurgically. Postoperative bleeding may close the ETV, and then acute hydrocephalus may occur. Is EVD better um, in those circumstances? It depends depending what kind of hydrocephalus it develops thereafter. If it is a proximal intersystemic obstructive hydrocephalus, I would advise a redo, an ETV redo. If not, I would do a shot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Henry, do, have you had experience, and, and for Ahmed as well, with choroid plexus coagulation? Uh, because someone had mentioned it earlier, and whether you have embarked on that and what you think of it. I know it's much more in a pediatric thing than controversy, but. Well. Yeah, I think we should discuss it when we talk about EGV next time. And we have, we had cases, or we ha had a nice case, there was some hypertrophy of the choroid plexus, and this patient was shunt dependent and has severe ascites. And then we made a bilateral choroid plexus coagulation and next day the ascites was gone. So this is obviously is it's working. And in the in very young people, there are some studies, you know this from Ben Worf, and he found that when we add CPC and ETV, the success rate is higher in the very young patients. There's a study now running in the US to confirm this, whether it's really better to make CPC and ETV or not. So you make a prospective study, so in some years we will know what is uh, really the problem. But in, in Uganda, they obviously had good results when they do both. We personally have not much cases. We did some, but all ended up with a shunt. This was a post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. My, my personal experience in the CPC uh, back in the turn of the millennium, we started that and we did it, and, and it was not very promising, as a matter of fact. Maybe a lot of cases were uh, the selection criteria then were not very clear, and that the uh, CPC was not that for cases of chronic hydrocephalus with, uh, with infection at whatever stage. Uh, but uh, we are planning to do a real mega project uh, and study about the CPC uh, here in, in Cairo University and, of course, with the uh, with the Greifswald uh, in the in the very near future. We've already registered that trial, and we are going to have a good look at it again. But again, this is something which cannot be. Uh, uh, reported before four or five years, because you have to measure other things other than the actual CSF production and the amount of hydrocephalus that is relieved or that you have succeeded to, 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 to solve. But uh, the, the cognitive function and the role of the choroid plexus and the CSF production and the chemical transmitters, etc., etc., etc. This is something which is really obscure. I, I, I don't know much about it. And I guess in the literature, there's nothing very clear in that sense. Thank you very much, Ahmad. We have another question regarding this field. And before I ask it, and it's related to uh, choroplexus coagulation. I, I think it was Hugh Griffiths in the UK in Bristol who, who embarked on that and had some success with it many decades ago. Um, I personally got involved in it when I worked in Canada. Um, and. Uh, was involved in doing quite quite a, a few of them. My question to you um, is two, really. One is, do you think it's worth the extra trauma of the surgery? Because there is a, you have to point the scope in certain directions. Now, whether you use flexible or not is another matter. If you have tips on that, um, but but do you have any any advice about how whether it's you think worth undertaking choroid plexus coagulation? considering the extra operative time and the in, essentially extra potential trauma um, using the endoscope. I think it's only, only in the very young where ETV is not working well. If you have an obstructive hydrocephalus, for example, tactile glioma, I think it's nonsense to make a CPC because ETV is working so well. But if you have this hypertrophy of the core plexus, this, I think it's a very good indication, but it's a rare case. I have just one case. But this worked very well, very convincing for me. So otherwise, I think it's only for the very young when you try to avoid shunting. But you know, the studies what have done have been done about comparison of shunting and ETV did not show much 
difference between ETV and shunt. So if you have the feeling that the ETV is not working well, you can place a shunt. Did you use a rigid scope or flexible to do the correct plexus coagulation? And what was your trajectory? In this case, what I have done, we make two boreholes. We came from the back to yeah. go to the lateral uh, ventricle central part and then go down to the temporal part. The major part of the core plexus is usually in the temporal horn. So you have to go there. And because I have not a flexible one or I have a flexible scope, but the, the electrode is not effective, I would take, I think it would take years to coagulate all the plexus of this patient. I will show in one of the next seminars, I can show the case. So I used the rigid one with the big bipolar forceps and then I could coagulate. And even that lasted for each side, I think one and a half hour. Because wow. it was a massive hydrocef a massive core plexus. Thank you, Henry. Um, a question to both of you um, from Miroslav. Um, it's a God forbidden event, but can you comment, please? Is it possible to stop the bleeding from basilar artery in the case of incident uh, during ETV? So, if you've got a basilar damage, um, when you when you grasp into the basilar, I think it's a disaster. What can you do? You place the endoscopic sheath, and that the blood goes out and not into the brain. And then you can try to put something in to close it. But I think if you have a big hole, it will be a disaster. If you rupture a perforator, then you can have success that it, you can occlude it with bipolar coagulation or um, you, you just make it with irrigation. But as I said, in our case, there was a rebleed. But if you have a basilar problem, I think it's very difficult to deal. With. There are some reports, they were lucky this, this, this uh, bleeding stopped after a while and then they make an intervention to, to deal with the pseudoaneurysm which then occurred. But the best thing is to avoid it. Yes. Ahmed, any comments about this? Go for yeah. It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As we say, put an EVD and um, get out or just irrigate. Um, Thank you very, very much. This has been uh, brilliant. We've been at this for an hour and 20 minutes so far, and uh, um, uh, we've had already still 80 odd who are still online learning and listening. Um, but I have to say it, it's been brilliant and we've got a series coming up. Uh, so the next webinar, if you would grace us, uh, will be focusing just on ETV. And there's a lot for us to discuss there. And uh, we'd be honored to have you back if that's okay with you. Um, yeah. And we can arrange it perhaps sometime in May uh, or very early June, but May, the sooner the better. Is, is that acceptable with you, Henry and Ahmad? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, if you have any um, comments you want to make, um, you're welcome to do so. But I, I just wanted, before you do, just to say a big thank you on behalf of the ANS CSF Task Force uh, and, and all the people involved. It's been really an honor to have you here. And we hope we're going to learn a lot more from you um, with, uh, in the webinars to come. Uh, so thank you to both of you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Okay. And okay. hope to see you soon in May. Yes, we will arrange it. And of course, this will be available for people, for the students and all the colleagues to, to recap and, and learn again. Um, uh, huge thank you. God bless you. And thank you to all the uh, audience who've joined us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in May. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Henry. Thank Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.